The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here you will find the unpredictability of old school paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. The dice determine all. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. In Chapter 73, the party manages to find a way to the mountain's exterior by moving through the Egogen's ventilation system. The serenity and beauty of the view from so high up on the cloud spur is contrasted by the obvious difficulty of the ascent to the ruins, even though they are not so very far away. Good news comes when the companions spot a trail that Harl and Daz know must lead down to a shrine and all the way up to the ruins. If they use this trail, their ascent will be out in the open and their chance of being spotted by the dragon will be significant, but is better than the alternative. Without the trail, they'll have to scale the cloud spur's sheer natural crags with no climbing equipment. The flicker of hope they feel upon discovering the path quickly goes out when Aridine sees a shape in the distant sky. At first, it seems that the dragon has already found them, but then Umura recognizes the approaching creature to be something quite different. She knows a wyvern when she sees one, and she knows just how deadly and aggressive these monsters are. The companions are trying to choose whether to hide or fight when Harl spots the nearby door to the shrine and decides that the party should make a run for it. They scramble across the rocks as fast as they dare, but the wyvern is soon upon them. Daz and Eridine stay outside to hold it off while the others get to safety. Eventually, they all manage to escape the wyvern, but not before it has jabbed Eridine with its venomous tail. When the young rogue stumbles into the safety of the shrine, the poison is already in her bloodstream. There is one last hope. The Mithridaticum elixir they found at the convent is a healing agent that can cure any known poison. But when Gyrios goes to retrieve it from his bag, it is gone. Panic-stricken, confused, and desperate, their effort to find the precious liquid is in vain. Of course, none of them have any idea that one night while they were fast asleep in the mushroom fields of Thangar, a thief by the name of Yegelin Strutright sneaked into their camp and stole it. While the companions try to figure out what happened, Eridine dies in the cleric's arms. Well, where do I even begin? I know these are not real people, but I do feel as though I've lost something precious in Aridine. I had to take a few days off Tale of the Manticore before I could bring myself to come back to the table, so to speak. To be honest, I still don't know what to say, but I suppose there is one thing I have come to believe. These moments of danger, and sometimes of tragedy and loss, they are the reason I care about these characters. Without the one, the other would vanish. You know, sometimes there's a conflict that can come up when you're the DM and the players. If the party had never found the Mithridaticum elixir, I would not have put a save-or-die poisonous creature in their way, or at least not for sure. Maybe they would have been included on a wandering monster list, something like that. But since they did find the elixir, I thought I should put such an enemy in their way. I never really planned for the appearance of Eagle and Strutright, the thief just sort of happened on a whim. Before him, my main concern was that the party would encounter a poisonous monster or a trap, and that more than one character would be poisoned. I imagined a situation where PCs would have to choose who to save and who to let die. Somehow, this encounter with Eredin and the Wyvern is worse. Gyrios will never know the truth, and even his opportunity to make an impossible decision was stolen from him, along with the remedy. Well, instead of going on and on about how I'm feeling, having lost Aradine, I'll put my words into the surviving characters' mouths. Chapter 
Chapter 74 Part 1 Day 100 Late Afternoon Party Status Harl 37 of 39 hit points Girios 30 of 37 Umura 18 of 25 Daz 14 of 17 Spells Available Umura has memorized Shield Knock and Lightning Bolt times two. Girios has prayed for Bless, Resist Fire, Striking, and Cure Serious Wounds. Somehow the others knew to leave Girios alone with Eridine, and for a long time the cleric just stayed where he was, sitting on the floor, cradling her head in his lap and weeping. Every now and then he stopped to shudder as a paroxysm of anguish washed over him and a moan escaped his lips. When he had no more tears, he began the journey through the phases of grief, one after another. He begged Mazagar to undo what had been done, and he grew angry when his prayer was not answered. Then came the self-loathing. It sunk into his flesh like rot. He wished he could trade places with the woman who had become so cold and pale. Then he simply wished that he was dead as well. Eventually, it was his own voice, or more accurately, the memory of his own voice, that pulled him back from the edge of despair. Many times during his early years as a wandering priest of the Sun God, he had offered comfort to the bereaved. It was arrogant to think that their pain was any less than what he felt now. If he truly had faith, he must take his own advice. Girios would speak soothing words to widows, saying, Unable are the love to die, for love is immortality. He once told a young mother who had lost a daughter, Such a great sorrow as yours can only be felt by those who have loved and been loved greatly. On more than one occasion, he had quoted from Prior Imrel, who taught him not to fear death. The Prior's kindly face now appeared in Girios's thoughts, and spoke words of wisdom. We are never where death is, and death is never where we are. Death and life, with only one exception, never coexist. A thing cannot be and not be at the same time. It is the same with death, and so we never experience it. Doesn't that make you feel better? Hello internet friends and welcome to Go Ask Alice, the show where we jump down random internet rabbit holes and bring you wonderful factoids from our adventures in Wiki Wonderland. I'm Drew, a forensic scientist, and my favorite word is sesquipedalian. I'm Lindsay, and I have resting friend-making face. And I'm Sarah, and I am in a constant state of existential crisis. Our travels through Wikipedia could lead us anywhere, so you never know what interesting topic you're going to hear about. Places we've previously visited on Wikipedia include... I ended up on a book called The Book of Wonders or The Book of Surprises. The Legend of the Cock Lane Ghost. Mimics from D&D. Cursed Tablets. Listen by searching for Go Ask Alice wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, I want to tell you about a webcomic based on the classic D&D adventure module, The Keep on the Borderlands. Follow a party of adventurers as they travel through the adventure. This comic is driven by characters, but the results of actions are based on dice rolls, just like a tabletop game. Start reading this exciting webcomic now. Visit thekeeptheborderlands.justinpfeil.com Let's discover together what's going to happen. The fire is the life that burns down to embers. The soul is the smoke carried up to the sky. The joyful memory the living remembers will come back to life on the day that they die. Girios had chosen an alternate prayer for Eridine since they could not bury her. He had positioned her on the antechamber floor, with her hands folded over her chest and covering the hilt of her longsword, which laid lengthwise over her body so that the blade pointed towards her feet. 
rigid and pale, with the contrasting dark veins so clearly visible under her skin, Eridine looked like a marble statue in human clothes. Several times during the blessing, they had heard the wyverns shriek through the stone door. Clearly, it was waiting for them, just as Umur had said it would. She and the two dwarves had been discussing their options in the next room before the prayer began. Once a wyvern gives chase, it is relentless, she had explained. They have been known to wait days for their prey to come out from hiding. We'll just have to hit it with everything we've got, Des had said, shaking his fist. No. Harl had a look in his eyes as though he were far away. I think there is another way. After Aradine's last rites were finished, Gyrios nodded sadly to his friends and stood up. He replaced his golden coin holy symbol in his bell pouch and sniffed. Harl sucked his teeth and then said, Follow me. Anoint yourselves first. He went to one of the urns and slid off the lid. The amber liquid inside had not been diminished by the passing centuries. It was lightly colored and scented, just like the ablution oil they had used in Dwarvar and that which they had been given at the start of their quest. Harl removed its gauntlets and dipped a finger into the vase-like urn. He rubbed a small amount of oil on the back of each hand and inclined his head at Daz, indicating that he should do the same. As before, this oil is holy and magical. Any dwarf that performs this ablution ritual will get a plus one bonus to all attack, damage, ability check, and saving throw rolls. The boon lasts for six hours. The oil may not be removed or stored elsewhere without losing its power. Umura anointed herself, asking Harl if it would be appropriate. Even Gyrios touched the back of his hands with the sacred oil. This was no heresy to him. He understood that Gruenmog was really just another aspect of Mazigar, at least in part. They walked under the arch and into the room beyond, where they had waited while Gyrios grieved alone. This room was of the same dimensions of the first, but it had two archways. These opened to long corridors, one on each side. There was also a set of iron double doors set in the wall opposite the archway they had come through. Earlier, they had explored down the right corridor and found a cluster of empty shelved storage rooms and simple living quarters, all long abandoned. Unlike the other spaces they had visited under the Aegogen, these rooms were caked with dust and ancient cobwebs hung from the ceilings like ragged pennants. It seemed even the spiders had taken their leave long ago. The other corridor they had left alone. Umura had spotted a very small glyph of warding at the tip of the lancet arch and stopped Harl before he could trigger it. The patterns in the glyph, Umura realized, told a kind of story. She hadn't quite gotten her mind around it fully, but she was beginning to understand that magical energy was somehow stored in its potential form by trapping it in a kind of geometric maze. Just then, Harl pulled open the double doors with a clang, and a cloud of dust was sucked into the room. The dwarf coughed. His beard and lips were now powdered like a confection. You do wait here a minute. Then he thumped Daz on the shoulder and motioned him to follow as he passed through the threshold. They left the reach of Umura's lantern glow, and soon the two were engulfed by darkness. Umura was left alone with Gyrios. In the past, she would have become awkward and chosen to wait in silence. But she was not that person anymore. She saved my life, you know. Gyrios didn't respond. Umura put a hand on his upper arm and continued anyway. Back when we fought the giant, she pulled me to safety. I wouldn't have made it if she hadn't done that. Gyrios met her eyes, and she saw his chin tremble just a little before the cleric managed to get out. Perhaps she will again. Here, Umura, take them. Gyrios handed her Eridine's bracers, the ones she had been given by Clendith Stonecarver. Umura accepted them and put them on. I'm honored, Gyrios. Now a silence did follow, but it didn't feel strained or uncomfortable. Once again, it was Umura who broke it. Are you all right, Gyrios? Gyrios avoided answering the question and instead said, It will avail us nothing to linger here. We must go on. Umura nodded sadly, biting her lower lip. I've done you wrong in the past, Gyrios, she said suddenly. I keep remembering what I said to you back in Thangar at the funeral. No, Umura, it's fine. You were upset. It's not fine. Do you remember what I told you? I do. I can't forget it. Indeed, Umura now burned with shame at the memory of her words, 
I haven't got a single friend who would show me such a lack of respect. And look at you. Friend to the dwarves, is that right? Gyrios looked at her with a somber expression, but remained silent. Umura still had her hand on Gyrios' upper arm. She squeezed it. Gyrios, do you know how many friends I had before I met you and the others? The cleric pursed his lips and shook his head slightly. None, said Umura. Then she swallowed hard and looked him dead in the eye. Not one. I've never had any friends until I met you. Umura, you don't have to do this. I need to say this, in case... Listen, I just want you to know. In Zaysha, a woman is worth nothing, less than nothing. The only exceptions are those of us with the ability to learn and use magic. We only have value because we can be married off to the rich and powerful. Do you remember where I said I was going when I was captured by the goblins? You were going to study with the sage, Gwil Godan, said Gyrios, nodding with understanding. I was being sent to him as a kind of gift. Actually, just as an offering, several women were meant to arrive at the same time, and he was to take his pick of us. As apprentice and as wife, no? More like a concubine, Gyrios. That's why when I was young I had no friends. There were no other girls around who were like me. My family only saw me as human livestock to be sent away for breeding as soon as possible. To be a girl in a sorceress in Zaysha is to be forever alone. Umora, Giria said gently, now taking her free hand in his. Why are you telling me these things? Because... I want you to know how much I love you, and Harl, and Aridine, and Kagan. That's why I couldn't bring myself to go to Koth. You are the only family I have. Gyrios, I'm trying to tell you that, as much as you're my friend and my family, I'm yours. I'm here for you, Gyrios, and I think you need someone. You don't have to go through this alone. Gyrios might have shed tears if he had any left. Instead, he pulled Umora into an embrace and hugged her tightly, until they heard the footfalls announcing the return of Harl and Daz. And I say it's the only way, and I'll not change my mind. But it's forbidden, Harl. Strictly forbidden. No one's ever done that before. No one has killed a dragon before either, but here we find ourselves on a mountain trying to do just that. Their voices were much louder now, and their faces could be seen in Umura's lantern light. Our culture is crowded with rules, and rules about rules, and prohibitions, and norms, and taboos. It'll get us there, and that's all I care about. Grudenbog may forgive us. What's more, it's the only way. We can't go back out the way we came in. Even if the wyvern weren't there, we'd still need to complete the ascent out in the open. I've made up my mind. You agreed to be ruled by me. And this is my ruling. The pair walked through the door just as Umura and Gyrios pulled apart. Sorry to interrupt, said Harl, tersely, looking up at his companions. It's time to move on. I'm sorry, we cannot stay longer. If we reach the summit before nightfall, well, that would be ideal. The others didn't fully understand Harl's intentions. Are we going further in? Do you think this will trick the wyvern into leaving? Harl, I told you, they are stubborn creatures. It will wait outside that door for day- You're not going back out that door, Harl repeated. I apologize. This is not an easy choice. Harl, what exactly do you have in mind? Dramatis Personae Umura Although the party has grown smaller and lost much with the death of Eredin, those who remain have been steadily growing stronger. Every so often, one of the characters has a breakthrough moment and reaches a new height. This is the case with Umura today, because this episode is a level-up episode for the sorceress. Despite still feeling sad about Eredin, I can't help being excited for this level-up. I'll have to check, but I think Umura is about to get access to a fourth-level spell. Okay, I just checked, and sure enough, at level 7, a magic user will have the following available to memorize. Three first level spells, two second, two third, and one fourth. That means I get to roll for a new spell. 
I think this is one of my favorite parts of the game. I've forgotten which spells are even on the list in the expert rules, so this is sure to be a surprise, no matter what the dice say. Page 14 of the expert rules lists 12 spells at level 4. Hang on while I fetch my d12. Okay, here's the roll. I've rolled a 12. What's that? Let's see. It's Wizard Eye. Well, not as glamorous as Polymorph Self, which I was hoping for as soon as I saw it on the list, but it might have its uses. The spell description is a simple one. It creates a floating eye that can travel up to 240 feet away from the caster. The eye has infravision, and if she concentrates, she can see whatever it sees. After an hour, it disappears. Getting Wizard Eye makes some sense. Umura has recently visited her home and seen her mother's homunculi. They're like permanent wizard eyes, in a way. Maybe she saw them with fresh understanding and it unlocked something in her brain that helped her to know this new power. Maybe that's it. But the real reason, I think, is somehow connected with that encounter with the spectator. Was there some extra planar stuff left over in her mind after she fell under its suggestion spell? Who knows? Umura doesn't instantly get the spell, of course. She'll have to wait until the next day to copy it into her spellbook and memorize it. I wonder, will the party reach the dragon before that even happens? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's stick with the business at hand. Umura can roll for new hit points. The roll. A two. Well, with her constitution bonus, that's three hit points. Her new total is 28. Now let's try for attribute increases. We'll go straight down the line, and as always, a six on a d6 is a winner. Strength. A 1. Intelligence. This score is already maxed out at 18 and cannot be increased further. Wisdom. This one would make sense. Does it happen? A 5. Almost, but no. Dexterity. A 3. Constitution. Another 5. Charisma. Last chance for an increase. Rolling. Yet another 5. Am I disappointed with that level up? Maybe I should be, but I'm not. The wizard eye and modest hit points are enough. Everything feels about right with this one. You may wonder, how about Gyrios? Doesn't he always level up with Umura? Not anymore. A while ago, his advancement was paused by one episode, so he won't increase in power until next time, assuming he and the rest of them make it that far. Chapter 74 Part 2 Day 100 Late Afternoon Party Status The party status is unchanged, with the exception of Umura, who now has 21 of 28 hit points. The layout of the shrine was completely different from the one in Thangar, but quite similar to its Dwarvarian counterpart. Harl realized quickly that that shrine must have been a copy of this one. They were standing in the main temple. It featured an altar that was a solid block of pure onyx. The onyx itself was a natural work of art. It was a mix of brown and beige and gray, showing ripples and wobbly concentric rings, almost like those found in cut tree trunks. Behind the altar was the great stone disc. Fully eight feet in diameter, even the graven skull in the center was taller than Harl. Little mushrooms and worms had been chiseled around the perimeter by a master sculptor. These images, they all knew, were the only lifelike images permitted inside a shrine to Grunmog. All other decorations were made from geometric shapes. Silver triangles and trapezoids were knotted together in a clever way so as to make the eye race around the design, looking for a start or a finish that wasn't there to be found. Below each, also in silver, an inscription had been set into the very wall. I can't seem to read these, said Umura, frowning. Nor could I. Well, not much of it. The average Egojinai wouldn't have been able to either. It's an old tongue, even for this place. This was a language only the Solemns would have bothered to learn. Which words do you recognize then? asked Umura. Well, perhaps I overspoke. There's only one word I could actually read here. Which one? Harl pointed at a rune. This one. And what does that word mean? Destiny. Umura just nodded, as though in that single word, Harl had translated the whole thing. I believe this is a sign, said Gyrios gently. His hazel eyes flashed in the lantern light. Umura, you believe in fate, if I am not much mistaken. Yes, I do, confirmed the sorceress. In your mind, our futures are written like these runes, or like the lines in that book you are always reading. I wonder, if fate is written, 
then the present moment must be the point in the story where the finger traces the words and speaks them out loud or in the mind. If that point in the story indicates the constantly moving now, then I ask this. Who was the reader? Umora looked at him and smiled. We'll make a scholar of you yet, Harl. <laughs> Harl chuckled. Then he looked at the huge skull grinning at him from the wall, and his own smile vanished. Come on. Help me move this thing, he said. Approaching it, he reached out a hand. The moment his fingers touched the surface, he disappeared. Thank you for listening to Tale of the Manticore. If you like what you've heard and want to support the show, there are now four ways to help. You can recommend the show online or to friends. You can like and retweet episode announcements on Twitter. You can pick up One Shot in the Dark on DriveThruRPG. And finally, you can rate or review the show on your podcatcher of choice. My thanks to everyone who has supported the show. I'd like to read a review from iTunes today. This one was posted by Stuff That's There. Stuff That's There writes, Darkly Delicious. Tale of the Manticore has been a great companion through these hard times. John pulls off a truly theatrical performance with many great guests. The dice hold a palpable weight throughout with John's superb handling of the BX rules. Congratulations for all the hard work and congratulations for making it to episode 50. Well, the bad news is that featuring this review is coming months late. But the good news is that the reason for that is my listeners' generosity with her reviews. Although this episode releases in late May, as I sit here typing, it's still early April. This review was posted last September. Currently, there are 85 reviews for the show, just from the USA alone, and worldwide it's almost double that. That's an embarrassment of riches for me, and I have folks like Stuff That's There to thank. So thank you, Stuff That's There. Glad you're enjoying my stuff. As always, I'd like to thank Jared Grimm for all the stuff he contributes in the role of Daz Augerstone. Find Jared on Twitter at Crazy Drunken Elf. I'm on Twitter too if you care to get in touch. Find me at Manticore Tail. Or if you prefer Instagram, I'm at Tale of the Manticore Podcast. My email is taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. I also keep a blog at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com where I post show notes, art, character sheets, maps, and other miscellany. The story will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore. The story where chaos rolls. Few things inspire you to create your own campaign more than hearing a bunch of friends enjoying theirs. But where do you start? Here at Undercommon Taste, we discuss tabletop gaming and homebrew content, as well as diving into the concepts of world building, content creation, game balance, and various DM tips. We focus mainly on 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, but most of our advice can be taken into any system. We dive into the existing lore of older editions, discussing the impact of bringing old, sometimes forgotten lore, into the current edition to bring your campaign worlds to life. We also host various game and game systems creators to get a sample of up-and-coming projects and to get their take on how to bring something unexpected and new to the table. So join us for Undercommon Taste, where we stir the pot and lick the spoon. Available wherever you find your podcasts.